Study Session 12, St. Augustine, Introduction. In this study session, you will learn about the ideas, works, and theories of St. Augustine. Learning Outcomes. When you have studied this session, you should be able to 1. Explain the life and time of St. Augustine. 2. Identify some of the works of Augustine. 3. Show how Augustine built on the legacies laid by St. Ambrose. 4. State the nexus between natural law and justice. 5. Discuss Augustine's theory of two cities and Galatius' theory of two swords. 6. Analyze Augustine's philosophy of history. Life of Augustine Augustine was born in Tagast, African province of Numidia, in 354 AD. His father was pagan and his mother, Monica, was a Christian. At the age of 16, Augustine began the study of rhetoric in Carthage. Although his mother had instilled in him the ways of Christian thought and behavior, he threw off this religious faith and morality. Taking at this time a mistress with whom he had a son, his thirst for knowledge impelled his extremely able mind to rigorous study, and he became a successful student of rhetoric. Several personal experiences led him to his unique approach to philosophy. He was 19 years old when he read Hortensius of Cicero. His Christian ideas seemed unsatisfactory to him. He was particularly perplexed by the ever-present problem of moral evil. How can one explain the existence of evil in human experience? The Christians have said that God is the creator of all things and also that God is good. How then is it possible for evil to arise out of a world that a perfectly good God had created? Because Augustine could find no answer in the Christianity he learned as a youth, he turned to a group called the Manichins, who were sympathetic to much of Christianity, but who, boasting of their intellectual superiority, rejected the basic monotheism of the Old Testament and the doctrine that the Creator and Redeemer of humanity are one and the same. In and the same. Instead, the Manichaeans taught a doctrine of dualism, according to which there were two basic principles in the universe. Take two, the principle of light or goodness on the one hand, and the principle of darkness or evil on the other. These principles were seen as eternal in conflict with each other. Although this dualism seemed to solve the contradiction of evil, in a God-created world. It raised new problems. How could one explain why there are two conflicting principles in nature? He became attracted to skepticism, but retained some belief in God. He left Africa for Rome, hoping for more effective career in rhetoric. Thereafter, he moved to Milan and became municipal professor of rhetoric in 384. It was here that Augustine came upon certain forms of Platonism, especially Neoplatonism, found in the image of Plotinus. He was fascinated by the conception of an immaterial world totally separate from the material world and the belief that people possess a spiritual sense that enables them to know God and immaterial world. Neoplatonism overcame Augustine's former skepticism, materialism, and dualism. Through Platonism, he was able to understand that not all activities are physical, that there is a spiritual as well as a physical reality. Intellectually, Neoplatonism provided what Augustine had been looking for but it left his moral problem still unsolved. What he needed was moral strength to match his intellectual insight. This he found in Ambrose's sermons. Neoplatonism 
had finally made Christianity reasonable to Augustine and now he was also able to exercise the act of faith and thereby derive the power of the Spirit without feeling that he was lapsing into some form of superstition. His dramatic conversion occurred in 386 when he gave real assent to abandoning his profession of rhetoric and giving his life totally to the pursuit of philosophy, which for him also meant the knowledge of God. He now saw Platonism and Christianity as virtually one, seeing in Neoplatonism the philosophical expression of Christianity. He was an incredible prolific writer and as he became a noted leader in the Catholic Church, he was inevitably involved in writing as a protagonist of the faith and a defender against heresy. In 396, he became Bishop of Ipo, the seaport near his native town of Tagast. Sabine, as described St. Augustine as a great convert and pupil of St. Ambrose. Similarly, as stated in the section of life of Augustine, the moral strength he needed to back off up his intellectual strength he found in the sermons of St. Ambrose. <laughs> in this way, it could be said that St. Ambrose impacted on him in no small measure. Hence, the need to look at the legacies of Ambrose upon which Augustine built. St. Ambrose of Milan was especially notable for his strong statement of the autonomy of the church in spiritual matters. There is no reason to think that, in this respect, he differed from other Christians of his time, but his outspoken statement of the principle and his courageous adherence to it in the face of opposition made him an authority to whom Christian writers returned in all later controversies where the point arose. Ambrose clearly asserted that in spiritual matters, the church has jurisdiction, power of control over all Christians, the emperor included, for the emperor like every other Christian is a son of the church. He is within the church, not above it. In yet another case, he steadfastly refused to surrender a church for the use of irons. Upon order of the Emperor Valentinian, the palaces belong to the Emperor, the churches to the Bishop. He admitted the authority of the Emperor over circular property, including the lands of the church, but church buildings themselves as being directly dedicated to a spiritual use. He denied the right of the emperor to touch. According to Ambrose, the secular ruler is subject to the church's instruction in spiritual matters and his authority over some ecclesiastical property. At least, is limited, but the church's right is to be maintained by spiritual means rather than by resistance. The precise limits between the two kinds of property were left vague. It was on this legacy laid by St. Ambrose that St. Augustine built his philosophy and which made him to be regarded as the most important Christian thinker of the age under discussion. Natural law and justice. For Augustine, public or political life was under the same rule of the moral law as was a person's individual or personal life. There is a single source of truth for both realms, and this truth he considered entire, inviolate, and not subject to changes in human life. All people recognize this truth and know it for the purpose of conduct as natural law or natural justice. Augustine considered natural law as humans' intellectual sharing in God's truth. Or God's eternal law. Augustine's notion of eternal law had already been anticipated by the Stoics when they spoke of the diffusion of the principle of reason throughout all nature, ascribing to this reason the role and power 
of ruling everything. The stock theory was the news, the principle of reason constituting the laws of nature. Whereas the Stoics then considered the laws of nature to be the working of the impersonal force of rational principles in the universe. Augustine interpreted the eternal law as the reason and will of the personal Christian, God, saying that the eternal law is the divine reason and will of God which commands the maintenance observance of the natural order of things and which forbids the disturbance if it since eternal law is god's reason commanding orderliness a person's intellectual grasp of the eternal principles is called natural law when a political state makes a law said augustine such temporal laws must be in accordance with the principle of natural law, which in turn is derived from eternal law. Augustine's chief argument regarding law and justice was that the political state is not autonomous, that in making laws the state does not merely express its power to legislate. The state must also follow the requirements of justice he accepted the formula that said that justice is a virtue distributing to everyone is due. But he asked what is due to anyone. He rejected the notion that justice is conventional, that it will differ with each society. For him, justice was to be discovered in the structure of human nature with its relation to God. Hence, he said that justice is the habit of the soul which imparts to every man the dignity due him. Its origin proceeds from nature, and this notion of justice is not the product of man's personal opinion, but something implanted by a certain innate power. To require the state to follow such a standard was obviously to place every moral limitation upon political power. By relating justice to moral law, Augustine argued that justice is not limited merely to relations between people. All of ethics, then, is based upon a person's love for God and love for his fellow man. Love is the basis of justice. Although Augustine's thoughts about law raised the church and religion to a position of superiority, over the temporal state, he did concede to the state the right to use coercive force. Indeed, the state is the product of humanity's sinful condition and therefore exists as a necessary agency of control. A society cannot be ideally founded unless upon the basis and by the end of faith and strong concord, where the object of love is the universal good which in its highest and truest character is God himself and where men love one another with complete sincerity in him and the ground of their love for one another is the love of him from whose eye they cannot conceal the spirit of love. Augustine's story of the two cities and Galatia's story of the two swords. The two cities the idea that man is a citizen of two cities, the city of his birth and city of God is ancient. This drawing a part of worldly and spiritual interest, the sense that the body is but chains and darkness to the soul, and that the soul must struggle continually against the burden of the flesh, was a real characteristic even of the pagan society in which Christianity grew up. The religious meaning of this distinction already suggested by Seneca and Marcus Aurelius became explicit in Augustine. What Augustine did was to restate this idea in Christian point of view. Man's nature is twofold. He is spirit and body and therefore at once a citizen of this world and of the heavenly city. The fundamental fact of human life is the division of human interests. 
the worldly interests that center about the body and other worldly interests that belong to the soul, this distinction lay at the foundation of all Christian thought on ethics and politics. St. Augustine, however, made the distinction a key to the understanding of human history, which is and always must be dominated by the context of two cities. On the one side stands earthly city, the society that is founded on the earthly, appetitive and possessive impulses of the lower human nature. On the other stands the city of God, the society that is founded on the hope of heavenly peace and spiritual salvation. The first is the kingdom of Satan, beginning its history from the disobedience of the angels and embodying itself especially in the pagan empires of Assyria and Rome. The other is the kingdom of Christ, which embodied itself in the Hebrew nation and later in the church and the Christianized empire. However, a certain caution is needed in interpreting this theory and especially in applying it to historical fact. It is not Augustine's meaning that either the earthly city or the city of God could be identified precisely with existing human institutions. The church is not for him the kingdom of God, just as the secular government was not identical with the powers of evil. The earthly city was the kingdom of the devil and of all wicked men. The heavenly city was the communion of the redeemed in this world. And in the next, throughout all earthly life, the two cities are mingled only to be separated at the last judgment. The theory of the Holy Roman Empire was built upon Augustine's city of God, but the conception by no means disappeared with the decadence of the empire. The two thirds, the characteristic position developed by Christian thinkers in the Augustine's age implied a dual, double organization and control of human society in the interest of the two great classes of values which needed to be conserved. Spiritually, interests and eternal salvation are in the keeping of the church and form the special province of the teaching conducted by the clergy temporal or secular interest and the maintenance of peace, order and justice are in the keeping of evil government and from the ends to be grieved by the labors of magistrates. Between the orders, that of the clergy and that of the civil officials, a spirit of mutual helpfulness ought to prevail. This conception is often spoken of as the doctrine of the two thirds or two authorities which received authoritative statement at the close of the 5th century by Pope Gelasius I. It became the accepted tradition of the early Middle Ages and formed the point of departure for both sides when the rivalry between the Pope and the Emperor made the relation of spiritual and temporal a matter of controversy as shall be seen in the following units. 12.6 Augustine's Story of History History is a dramatic story of the struggle between these two societies and of the ultimate mastery which must fall to the city of God. This is Augustine's interpretation of the fall of Rome. All earthly kingdoms must pass away, for earthly power is naturally mutable and unstable. It is built upon those aspects of human nature which necessarily issue in war and greed of discrimination. Augustine saw in the conflict between the two cities the clue to a philosophy of history. What he meant by philosophy of history was that history has a meaning. The early Greek historians saw no pattern in the events of humanity other than, perhaps, the fact that kingdoms rise and fall and that there are cycles of repetition. Aristotle considered history as hardly capable of teaching people. 
any important knowledge and humanity because, unlike drama, history deals with individual persons, nations, and events, whereas drama deals with universal conditions and problems. But Augustine, but Augustine thought that the greatest drama of all is human history. Its author, moreover, is God. History begins with creation, is punctuated by such decisive events as the fall of man and the incarnation of God in Christ. The present historical moment is involved in the tension between the city of God and the city of the world. Thus, when the barbarian gods sacked Rome in 410, the pagans laid the blame upon the Christians, saying that their excessive emphasis upon loving and serving God had the effect of diluting patriotism and weakening the defense of the state. To answer such charges and many others, Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, in 413. To answer, take two, to answer such charges and many others, Augustine wrote his book, The City of God in 413. In it, he argued that the fall of Rome was not due to the subversive activities of the Christians, but on the contrary to the rampant vice throughout the empire, which the Christian faith and love of God could have prevented. He regarded the Christian church as a turning point of history. The history of the church, therefore, was for Augustine quite literally the march of God in the world. The human race is needed a single family, but its destiny is reached not on earth but in heaven. And human life is the theater of a cosmic struggle between the goodness of God and the evil of rebellious spirits. All human history is the majestic unfolding of the plan of divine salvation, in which the appearance of the church marks the decisive movement. Henceforth, the unity of the race means the unity of the Christian faith under leadership of the church. With this, Augustine took what he considered otherwise random persons and events and supplied them with a comprehensive meaning, a philosophy of history. Study session summary. In this study session, you have learned that 1. St. Augustine was an African and enjoyed the benefit of both pagan and Christian parentage. 2. St. Augustine built his ideas on the legacies laid by St. Ambrose. 3. Whereas the Stoics considered the laws of nature to be the working of the impersonal force of rational principles in the universe. Augustine interpreted the eternal law as the reason and will of the personal Christian God, saying that the eternal law is the divine reason and will of God which commands maintenance, observance of the natural order of things and which forbids the disturbance if it for the church is not for in the kingdom of God. Just as the secular government was not identical with the powers of evil. 5. On the one side stands earthly city, the city that is founded on the earthly, appetitive, and possessive impulses of the lower human nature. On the other stands the city of God, the society that is formed in the hope of heavenly peace and spiritual salvation. 6. History is a dramatic story of the struggle between these two societies and of the ultimate mastery which must fail, take two, and of the ultimate mastery which must fall to the city of God. End of study session 12. Thank you for listening.